Thanks for the warm welcome. So we're starting with a little quiz, right? If you want to convert an int to a string, what's the fastest way to do it? So the first way is to just say double quotes plus well. That's sort of the lazy programmer's way of doing things. You, know, you don't want to put in an effort. You don't care about code quality. You just say double quotes plus well. So it makes a string builder and does a whole bunch of stuff. The second one is to say integer.toString, string, a bit more diligent, integer.value off, string.value off, and integer.get integer. So how many of you say the first one is the fastest way to convert an int to a string? Okay, one lazy guy in the class. Okay, good. Um, how many say the second is the fastest way to convert an integer to a string? Okay, a few more hands going up. The third one? All right, it's actually the same as the second one. Um, the fourth one? And the fifth one? No one? Seriously? Good, because it doesn't actually do it. All right, um, the, the second question is, which do you think is the fastest way of appending strings together? So in the first one, it's again the lazy way. I'm simply saying return, you know, strings pasted together with plus. And the second way, I'm using append string builder. And then the third way, which is sort of the, the fastest way normally, but, you know, we'll see. Um, the third way, I'm first working out how much space I actually need in the array before I create the string builder. Once I've done that, then I go back and I add all the strings into the string builder. So I've got all the cost of calling length and plus. Plus is very expensive, of course. And then after that, um, I'm converting it to a string. So who says the first one is the fastest way of doing it? Okay. So who says the second is the fastest? Okay. And the third? Okay, now I need one more option, which is I haven't got a clue. Right, anybody there? Okay, one person's <laughs> willing to admit that. Great. Um, now, let's go back a few years, like a long time, 21 years, to when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, you know, Java 1.0. I programmed for a very short time in Java 1.0, and then we went over to Java 1.1. Um, and in those days, we had a char array of the value as a field. We have an int offset int count. So um, they used to use, the hash code used to use samples of the chars if it, was strong, if it was longer than 16 characters, which actually meant that the hash code was a constant time operation, order run operation, quite funny. Um, equals didn't check if the object was the same as this, and they in turn used a static hash table. So they never ever deleted strings out of the hash table, just a constant mem memory leak there. They also had a string buffer, which was, looked a bit like the string builder, but it was a thread safe version of, of that, that construct. And um, what was quite interesting about this is when you made a string buffer, when you, um, when you said two string, it actually shared the same underlying array that was used inside the string buffer with the string. So you wouldn't generate another char array just because you're making a string. So this is pretty cool. So this is what the hash code looked like in string 1.0. And you can see that if the length is less than 16, then um, we add up all the chars with some calculation. And if it's bigger than 16, then they only look at eight of the characters. They don't look at every eighth character, they only look at eight. So if you've got a, a string of 1,024, it only looks at eight characters inside that string. So this was the hash code in 1.0. And you can imagine if you have lots of different strings, which differ slightly, they're all going to end up with the same hash code. I'm Heinz, as I said already. Um, I do jQuery. Um, and Dimitri is a friend of mine. He, he helps with jQuery. He's the chief disorganizer, because we don't have organizers, we don't have disorganizers. Um, and he helped me. We did this together, this talk at Oracle Code 1, Java 1, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, or four weeks ago. I don't, can't remember. It's such long. It's like America. So it's like, to me, it's like an, an age ago. Um, uh, and so we did a lot of the research together um, on the performance of the strings and so on. And so it's, it's a joint talk, but of course he's not here, so I'm doing it by myself. And I do the Java Specialist newsletter, so if you're not subscribed, you really should. Pop over there and put your name on. All right, let's go to Java 1.1. Um, so with Java 1.1, the fields stayed exactly the same. The hash code was still the same, sampling. 
they moved in turn to native code and they did some weird stuff like two uppercase now had a special edge case for Turkish and for German. So you had uh, the German SZ became two capital S's. Now there actually is now a Unicode character for a capital SZ, but at the time there was not a, a, um, one for that. So there's some weird stuff happening with two uppercase. Job one or two, let's move on. The fields stay the same, but the same, they, they, they change the hash code function. Instead of only looking at eight characters, they look at all the characters inside the, um, inside the hash code. So you can see there's, um, uh, you can imagine, first of all, that this broke a bunch of tests and broke a bunch of code because people expected the hash code to sort of stay the same. So if you, for example, took, yeah, let's, say, let's say you had a hash table and you serialize that in Java 1.0, or no, sorry, 1.1. You serialize it, and then you deserialize it in 1.2, um, all of a sudden it was all different. The, the hash, hashes were all different, different alignments and so on. And um, a lot of people sort of started expecting hash code to never change. And so they changed it, and that broke a bunch of things. And, and because of that, um, there was an outcry even then, you know, in Java 1.2, and since then they have not dared to change the hash code function again. So it always, since then, it's given the same value for the same string. This produces some problems. You'll see it in a moment. Um, they also introduced the comparable interface. So now, string was also comparable. We'll get back to comparable in a moment. Now, Java 1.0, 1 1.1 1 calculation was constant type. Java 1.2 was now linear type. So linear to the size of the string. If you have a bigger string, it takes longer to do the hash code for calculation. And um, there was a book that was written um, quite a long time ago about Java 2 performance. Now, performance books go out of date incredibly quickly because um, the rules change. It's a bit like the tax law in Greece, right? Every five minutes, there's a new law, so you can't keep up. And uh, my accountant, like he, he'll, he'll speak to somebody and he'll tell, so he'll tell them the law, and then the law changes. He has to remember who he said what to, so he can tell them, no, 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 what I told you is not true anymore. It's now completely different. And then we backdate laws to, again, let's stop talking about this. Anyway, that's like performance, right? Performance changes all the time. So things which were true 10 years ago are not necessarily true today. In fact, they might be completely wrong. So they proposed wrapping string with its own object and caching the hash code. So you should, they, should never, they said never use a string inside a hash table. Now, it doesn't really work that much because... Here's a, here's a really bad hash code. It, it takes 100 milliseconds to calculate the hash code. This is really slow. You can't get much slower than that. Um, but if you, if you call put 30 times, if you put into a hash table, it's going to take three seconds approximately. It's not going to take more than that because each hash code is only called a single time. And the hash table internally caches the hash code anyway. Same with get. You call get 30 times, um, and of course, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to, um, to call get, you're going to generate a key, and then you're going to call get, the get's going to call hash code on your generated hash key, and then it's going to um, get back with the value. So, so there, there's no real benefit to caching it inside, the, or to wrapping string with another class and caching the, caching the hash code. Um, and, um, but in Java 3, they decided to do that anyway. Um, now, if you look at this, the char, the char a value, that's an array that is uh, on, a, on a, let's take a, let's take a, a 60, a 32-bit machine, because that was at the time very common, a 32-bit machine. So a 32-bit machine, a char value array would have been four bytes. The offset would have been four bytes as well. The count four bytes, and um, that would give you 12 bytes. But at the time, on a 60, on a 32-bit machine, the, the, the object, a header was 16 bytes. So you take 16 bytes plus 12 comes to um, 20, no sorry, it was 8 bytes. 8 bytes for object header, 8 bytes plus 12 gives you 20 bytes. Um, for, the, for the object without the array, so not counting the array size, um, but it got rounded up to, to, to 24 because it's always 8 byte alignment. So on a 32 bit machine, the hash was basically for free. Didn't cost anything, right? Because um, we had eight byte alignments. So they could actually sneak it in there without, without it costing anything. And you can see that here the, the, the way the, the, the algorithm works is h equals hash. If h equals naught, then work it out. Okay, so 
Um, and the reason they take zero as a default value is that then you don't have to actually initialize int hash. It's very important to not get data races on a string. You really can't have data races on a string. So if they said, for example, private int hash equals 42, then that would um, be, that would have a potential data race on the hash. Um, it, if the, somehow the string escaped um, before it was finished calculating, or if the code was rearranged and optimizing compilers and uh, pipeline and all sorts of other things, then you might end up with, with having um, uh, with, with having hash having two values, a possible two values. So it's the only safe value to use is zero. That's the only one they can actually use over here. All right, now, here are a bunch of strings. I know it looks to you like I'm writing Greek, but it's not. <laughs> it's actually, there's something that all these strings have in common. Anybody know what, the, what these strings have in common? Correct, hash is zero. Now, that was a good guess, because, I mean, you, there's no ways you would be able to figure that out in your head. But absolutely, for each of these strings, the hash in the end equals zero. So, um, and if you look at the calculation, it's basically you're adding values together by 30 time, 31 times and just shifting along. And so, these strings end up with hash code zero. So, what, where does it bring us? Well, all of them have hash code equals zero, and because the algorithm works the way it, it does, once you reach zero, you can actually copy and paste that string back to itself and it still end up as zero. So, um, and that's something which all of these uh, hash code, all these strings have in common, is that it, you can combine them in any way you want. Um, here, for example, is a bunch of them added together. The hash code will still equal zero. So let me show you something that you could do. So if you go to... Um, to just get to. So here's a little test I wrote, and um, what, what this test does is it puts a bunch of uh, strings into a hash map, and then it, it calculates how long it takes to, to find these strings again. So if I, now I've, I've compiled this with Java 6, so this is now Java 6, 16065. And if I run the code, string DOS, you can see that as the size of the table increases, it's 128 or 64 just now, 256, the, the time to look up the element increases linearly. Now, I've got a loop, and the loop does a lookup. So, because it's a loop and a lookup, um, the lookup is linear. So, a loop times a linear equals quadratic. So, you can see as the size doubles, it's actually taking four times as long. It's quadratic. Now, the actual lookup is linear. So it's a hash map with the linear, because what happens is you end up with a long linked list of elements inside the hash table. So this is what you can see now. So it goes to like three seconds. The next time it's going to be probably 12 seconds. Sometimes there's a bump as um, code gets optimized and profiled and so on. But essentially you can see that it's, 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 it gets a lot slower as you have more and more strings. Now, you could generate an infinite number of strings with hash code equals 42 or any other number, whatever you choose. But it's really easy to do it with hash code zero because you can just take a bunch of strings with zero and paste them together in any combination you want and you end up with, with, a, with, with a, um, a potential attack that you can use against someone. Now, we'll get back to that in a second to show you what, what was done against that. So this was a problem we had from Java 1.2 actually already. Um, so, as I said, put and get both become linear, and so you can use it to attack a server by sending lots of strings which, have to ha which happen to have a hash code of zero. Um, in Java 1.4, they have the same fields as 1.3. They introduce something called a trial sequence interface, which is an interface implemented by both string buffer and string. So they've got a common interface that both have, and they've got regular expressions which you can use for you know, uh, matching, you know how that works. Um, now, before we go on, <clears throat> over here, I've got hello, and I'm saying print line hello plus arg zero. Now, the compiler would turn this into new string buffer, dot append hello, dot append arg zero, dot two string. So this is how the, the plus, the double quotes plus, was converted into a string. 
Um, this new string buffer would construct an array of size 16. And then if you have a very long name, like uh, Konstantinidis, or um, yeah, you can get some very long Greek names. Then, um, and if it exceeds 16, hello plus it ex exceeds 16, then it would have to make a bigger array, so end up with two arrays being constructed. Um, and then in the end, the string would share the underlying char array of the string buffer. All right. Just wanted to mention the wover. Okay. I would love to be able to read all your minds. Actually, I don't think you never want to do that. But the, it's important to leave comments if you don't like the talk. It's really important because that gives us a, a way to improve the talk for next time. If you, if you like it, please vote. Don't forget. All right. Java 1.5, we went to... Um, so the fields are the same as 1.3, but they mark them as final. Of course, hash can't be final because it changes. Now, the funny thing with hash is it's, it's, not, it's actually not thread safe in a way because two threads could at the same time call hash code. And then they would both update the value. But the end value will be the same. It doesn't matter which um, thread writes first. Or if they're both right, it's the same value. And because it's a 32-bit a value, it doesn't matter if they're both right at the same time. It's going to, the actual write's going to be atomic, so they're going to always have a correct value. You don't have splitting of values. They also added code points, and uh, string builder was used as a replacement for string buffer. Um, now, the, what the, the side effect of that is that the char was no longer shared with the created strings. So if you, if you add a strings to, if you did string builder to create a string, it would then, once you said two string, make another char array and waste memory. Um, now, the thing is that people who, who had handcrafted string buffer code would now have to go and, and, uh, and uh, undo all that work. Also, if you, if you had compiled code in Java 1.4, you would now have to recompile it for Java 1.5. Um, otherwise, it would be slower. 1.6, they changed something. Um, they added something called compressed strings. Now, this was either a byte array when it was 7-bit ASCII. So um, only America was happy with this, right? Not Germany or France or Greece. No one was happy except for America. Um, and, and it was quite weird because a string would either have inside a byte array or a char array, which made it quite funky trying to figure out um, where your bottleneck is. Because you look in your, in, your, in your profile and you see a whole bunch of byte arrays, char arrays. You don't know which one's string. And they also added something, something called optimized string concat. And uh, this meant that the char array could, in some case, not always, be shared by the string builder, string buffer, and string. So you had the same optimization that was happening before inside the Java code, now happening behind the scenes. So this was the answer for the, for the, first, for the, uh, for the second quiz, actually. Um, which one is faster? And the answers, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same for all Java versions. It does not matter. They're exactly the same. Right? Uh, if, you, if you do it hand-coded or not, but it's only the same because it's strings. If it wasn't strings, it would not be the same. And we'll get back to that in a moment. Job 1 at 7, they changed something. And what they did was they decided to, um, first of all, get rid of the offset and the length inside the string and say that the entire value is inside the array. So the effect of that is that substring now could would, would now construct additional char arrays. So you actually had quite a bit of memory being wasted through substring. Um, they also added a new constructor, which was quite funky. You can actually construct um, strings in Java 7 and 8 with an existing char array. There's a class called Shared Secrets that allows you to make a string with an existing char array. So now the string isn't actually immutable at all anymore because you can pass in a string, make a string, and then you could, you could actually change the char, the char if you wanted to. Um, there's something else that, did that added a second hash value int hash 32. This hash 32 was used to avoid this attack that I showed you a moment ago. So, if we go back to our code for a moment, and um, we run it again with Java 7. Ah, no, I lost. Oh, that's the wrong. That's why. Java 7. You can see that the default behavior is exactly the same as in Java 6, right? As we double the size, it gets slower and slower and slower and slower. It's a linear performance for the lookup. See, they're going slow and slow and slow. Okay? 
So you can see that it's the same. But if you enable this alternative hashing, which you do with that um, minus djdk map alt hashing threshold. Now, the threshold says after, after the size of the array inside the hash map, um, after you reach that size, or once you get close to that size, then you start doing the, the optimization. So initially, it's exactly the same as before, but once you reach a certain size, after this, it's going to go and optimize it and rehash with a, with, with a different hash code. So it's a different hash code, which, which you can't, um, it, it, it's, it's got a seed, so it doesn't always have the same, um, the same initial value. You can see that, that the lookup cost is now constant time. Now, of course, it's still possible in theory to create a, a map, uh, but they don't do that anymore. Okay, Java 8, they changed a few things. They got rid of the hash 32, and they, they, they decided to, to rather have a, have a general solution for the problem of bucket collisions. So, um, let me show you how, how it works in Java 8. So, take Java, let's see this one. Java 8. Now, I can just run it normally, no special flags. And you can see that as the size increases of the map, I still have all the entries inside one bucket, but it creates a binary tree. Now, this works especially well when your values are comparable. Right? So, a string, for example, is comparable, so it works, it works very nicely. Um, so, this is, our, this is how it works over here. Let me stop it, otherwise it's going to um, run for the rest of today. Okay. They also did something else, which is deduplication. And deduplication um, is a really funky little, um, little, little feature that we have in Java. Um, this happened, this is, we have this since Java 18020. Now, if you're a Java programmer, you obviously have noticed that we're now churning out new versions of Java every six months. Um, and it can be confusing if you're used to Java, to the, how Java was before, where over 20 years there's a new Java version, or every three or four or five years. Um, but it's actually quite useful, because in the past, they would give us some features like this one, in the middle of a Java 8 version. So you'll have like Java 8.20 is deduplication. So when, we, when we're doing performance analysis of a system, we also have to ask, what version of Java are you using? They say Java 8. So yes, 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 I know Java 8, but exactly which build are you using? Right? And then we'd know, okay, if it's Java 8.20, then it's got deduplication. If it's 8.40, then it's got this, and 8.60 has got that. Uh, it's, it's really really harder, it's actually quite, hard, quite really harder to differentiate between that. So now it's easy. Is it what version is Java 11? Okay, Java 12, right, after six months, Java, Java 13. So it's much easier to actually um, differentiate the features that you have available than before. It was all Java 8, but which Java 8 is it? Which exactly is it? Um, so this is a great feature. It, it works only with G1, and you have to turn it on explicitly. There is a runtime performance cost in doing this, but it can save a lot of memory, depending on what you're doing, right? Um, so if, if you have a lot of strings, a lot of strings which are often duplicated, then that can deduplicate automatically. What that means is, let's say that I've got two different strings. Now, I've, I've made two strings over here. The strings are with a char array. So when you make a new string, it actually copies the char array, it clones the char array. So I've got two different char arrays inside these two strings. If I then look at the value field, it's a, it's a char array, and you can see by the number, this is the identity hash code over here, which is not the memory location, it's a random number, but normally, two objects which are different will have a different number. Not always, but most of the time. So you can see here, there are different numbers, which indicates that probably it's also two different objects. And then, um, after the object has gone through a number of GC um, paths, so, uh, GC cycles. After a number of GC cycles, the, um, the object will be deduplicated with any other string that is already inside, the, in, inside its map. So this is not the same as in turn. In turn would make the, the two pointers to the strings the same. This is not the same as in turn. This is deduplication. So the string, the char array inside the string is, 
that is shared between the two. So you can see after the GC, they'll be the same. Now, of course, you can do system GC. System GC will do a full GC, and the objects will end up in the, in the old space. Um, but the, the thing is that even without an explicit system GC, eventually these will be deduplicated. Obviously, deduplication costs you some time, some, some processing time. Um, and, and so uh, you have to evaluate, you have to check whether it's going to make it faster or make it slower within Noticeit. But it should decrease memory quite a lot. Um, so how much memory does a string actually take? I already gave you some hints about this. Most of the time, not as we use 64-bit virtual machines with compressed oops on. Most of the time, we don't run with heap space larger than 50 gigabytes. And um, so there's no reason to have uncompressed oops. Um, we, we don't want to have eight bytes per pointer. We rather want to have uh, four, pi four bytes per pointer. It makes things much faster. So the string object itself is 12 bytes for the object header, plus four bytes for the value, plus four bytes for the hash. That's basically what we saw over here. So sort of 15 minutes, so. Should be okay. Um, so if you go back to the structure, we had the, the, the value pointer, which is four bytes, the hash, which is four bytes, and 12 bytes for the object header. This gives you rounded up to 24 bytes. So it's 24 bytes for the object. And then the char array itself is, again, an object, so it's 12 bytes for the header, plus uh, 24 bytes for the 12 characters for Hello World, plus four bytes for the length, the length, the int length, gives you 40 bytes, a total of 64 bytes. Deduplication would automatically save you 40 bytes of this. But if you, in turn, you do 64 bytes, but at a very high cost, or a much higher cost. With in turn, um, in turn table does not grow. So once you start filling up your in turn table, um, it's actually going to be, end up being, um, being really big, um, like lots and lots of collisions per bucket. Um, you can actually, in Java 9 onwards, see what's happening inside your string table with vm.stringtable. This is very, ha very handy to be able to do. So you can see what is in my string table and what's my collision rate in the string table. See that as well. You can also write your own concurrent hash map um, with put of absent. That, that can potentially be, be better, but we have to be careful that strings which are never used again um, wouldn't be deleted from there, so you end up with a possible potential memory leak. Now, Java 9, 10, 11, everything changed again, because we change things all the time. Was there a question? No. Oh, no. Just a wave. Okay. So, Java 9, 10, 11, we have a, a byte array for the value instead of a char array. Um, we've got a byte coder and an int hash. Now, we'll talk about a bunch of things. First of all, plus is no longer compiled to the string builder. This used to be done. Then I use something, use, um, use invoke dynamic, um, which replaces the, 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 the call with a call to string concat factory. Now, I've done a bunch of different demos and benchmarks. Have a look at this GitHub repository covered string performance. You'll see everything in there with results as well. And this is now, um, a benchmark that we did, which is a bit fairer as a benchmark. Now, what this does is it, is it adds values together, but it's not only strings. If it's only strings, it doesn't matter what you use. But if you are adding strings and ints and longs mixed together, then it does matter. And if you look at Java 6, for example, in Java 6, the fastest way of doing it was to say string buffer sized. So it's sort of the last option I gave you in, that, in the quiz too. String buffer sized. That was the faster, 220 nanoseconds per, per add. Um, and, and actually, that stayed the same. The string buffer size stayed the same um, for Java 6, 7, and 8. That was, that was always the fastest option. right? Um, but in Java 11, and this includes 9 and 10. We just left out those results. Java 11, the fastest way of adding them together is with the plain, lazy, old plus. 127 nanoseconds, it's almost, it's about twice as fast as the, the fastest in Java 8. So, so the problem is you have these, you know, in the past it was fastest to do one thing. And if you do the same thing now, it's now twice as slow as if you just did the old lazy way. It happens quite often. 
That's how the laws change of performance. The string format is, is a very convenient way of, of doing string formatting. You can see it's always been the slowest. It's like, like really slow. I mean, it's like 20 times slower than just the normal plus. Um, I still use it because string format is incredibly convenient. And if you're doing a system out print line, it really doesn't matter how long it takes to construct, construct the string because the bottleneck is going to be your output stream. So, um, so do whatever you want. But, and, and also, the, there's a promise that in the future, they're going to make the string format to be the same speed as the normal plus. So that's what they're working on, Java 12, 13, 14, 15. Sometime in the future, the format will increase in speed to be as fast as just the normal plus. All right, how does it work? It uses invoke dynamic for concatenation. And they actually have six different algorithms that they use for adding strings together. Bytecodes generation, which is very much, very similar to what used to be in the past. So the BCSB is like Java 5 concatenation. And then the, the, the one they use by default is MH inline sized exact, where they work out the exact size of what they need in the byte array and then, and then add them together. So um, the performance, this performance, I'll just quickly mention how you can set it up with Java Lang invoke string concat. Um, and the results are that, that the default is the fastest, right? Quite a bit faster than anything else. Something else that added in Java 9 was the ability to compact strings. Now, it won't affect you. It only works for America and Germany. See, Java 6 worked for America, not Germany, but now the, I think Merkel complained about that, and now they've got also Germany. So if it's Latin one, so French will work, German will work, Greek won't work. Greek, if you have Greek, it's actually going to use still two bytes per character. Right. Now, in theory, they could actually have like a, the, the, the coder, but the coder byte could actually also support Greek and whatever, Bulgarian, whatever else you want to have. But um, they, they, uh, I don't think they're going to do that. It's, it's basically, it's either Latin 1 or you pay the extra price. The funny thing is that there's actually now a limit, a, big, a, a smaller limit as to the maximum size of string you can have in Greece with Java 9. Because it's a byte array, not a char array. So with a byte array, you can only have up to 1 billion characters, whereas with a char array, you could have had 2 billion characters. All right. There's a kill switch if you don't want it, minus compact strings, but you probably want to leave it on most of the time. Um, the performance is a bit slower with a plus, with compact strings off. Um, not exactly sure why. And, and also, it uses a lot more memory, right? So you, you really want to use compact strings on by default. Now, something which they did a lot of is intrinsics in Java. So in Java 8, you've got intrinsics. And in Java 9, they had 11. They've got a lot more intrinsics, a whole, all of this, the, the code that's... An intrinsic basically says that if you take something like equals or compare to, the code that is, that is really called is not the code that you see in the Java class. It's, a, it's some special hard-wired... Hard code there. So if you take, for example, equals, and this is what equals looks like, and if you write that, um, let me try to see, if you, for example, write it yourself, um, this is what string Latin equals looks like, and you try and write it yourself. Now, a hotspot intrinsic candidate is really important, because that gets, that says it's going to be hopefully replaced with intrinsics. Now, if you, if you run this, running through the array, um, versus a normal string equals, you'll find that that your handcrafted version is going to be much slower than string. And the reason is vectorization. There's, this another, there's a method called arrays.mismatch, which you can use for, for comparing arrays, which is a, which is a much faster way of, of comparing than one by one. And you can see the performance here. As the length gets bigger, the difference between string equals and hand-rolled becomes quite significant. So if you've got a string of 256 characters, um, you took, look, looking at about six times faster for doing it just with string equals than trying to do a hand-rolled one. But the reason is vectorization. Um, also, deduplication is not taken into account when you do string equals. So this is the end of my talk, actually. We've got five minutes for questions. Um, just the lesson from today. Use plus. 
It's much easier than to, and it's easier and it's actually faster. But you also have to recompile your classes for Java 9. You also should avoid using in turn either your string duplication or your own cache in very specialized cases. Hashing is expensive, especially if the hash resolves to zero, and there isn't really a, a, a good way to get around that. Um, since Java 9 also strings used byte arrays, no longer char arrays, and uh, if you want to see more about this, have a look at my GitHub repository. You can run the test yourself with JMH. Any questions? We've got five minutes, I think. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, five yeah. minutes for questions. Questions, come on. Who's got a question for Heinz? Don't rely on me this time. Uh, right. There's my man. Let's send the runner over. Thank you, Heinz. Very, very interesting. Um, you talked a little bit about um, you know the new versions coming up and adoption. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what you're actually seeing companies do? Are they adopting new versions? Are they yeah, using them in production That's already? People are mo moving over quite quite quickly to well, companies are now moving over to Java eight quite well. Java eight. Yeah, Java eight. So it's not, it's not just, so just for the recording, it's 2018. So we move over to Java 8 slowly but surely. And then Java 8, after that we go to Java 11. Um, so from Java 8, um, so, so, so there's actually, as you can see, there's a, a performance wind going to Java 11. And if, you, if, you've, if you've been a, a well-behaved programmer, if you haven't gone and uh, you know, used unsafe and done all sorts of weird stuff with weird packages, um, it's actually quite, uh, quite easy nowadays to move to Java 9 or 10 or 11. It used to be hard, but now all the tooling is there, so you can move up fairly easily. Um, and you should see a performance improvement by doing that. So there's a, there's a benefit. I mean, the G1 collector, for example, is, is vastly different to Java 8. So you actually want to go over to the newer versions. There, there's a business reason to do it, better performance. Another question? Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, like, in the age we're living where, like, uh, Java versions might last, like, what, six months or 18 months tops, are, like, the JVMs that various companies are going to release, are they all created equal for, like, for what you see for the performance reasons? I mean, we're seeing, like, um, Amazon releasing their new JDK and, um, like, Red Hat's going to release under Adopt JDK, and IBM has their own uh, JVM. So um, do you see differences in performance, like or for strings and specifically, or like other stuff in your day-to-day -day work? OK, so um, yeah, we've got a lot of vendors now. We've got Azul doing Zulu. Um, we've got Oracle doing Open JDK and Oracle JDK. Um, if you are using Oracle JDK, you need a license to use it in production. So basically, Oracle JDK is like running Java 8 with, with, with unlocked commercial features or options. It's, it's like that, right? So if you, if you want a license, then use that if you want to. Um, and then you've got Open JDK by Oracle. Now, Oracle promises to maintain Oracle, Open JDK for six months, and then they move on to the next version. So, so they focus always on the next version, next version, next version, give us new features, which is great. And then they, they also have a commercial offering as well. Um, what you'll find is that the, I don't think that the, the features will diverge gr greatly. Um, uh, Red Hat has their own JDK, um, but they're being bought by IBM. So that's now, I don't know what the, I, don't know, I, I, think they'll, I think IBM will still allow Red Hat to maintain the JDK. Um, and Red Hat has been maintaining Java 8 and Java 7 and Java 6, all these things as well. So it's, it's, it's a good, good company to do that. Adopt Open JDK is a different thing. That's done by the London, London Java community. And there is no commercial support for that at the moment. Uh, maybe we'll see, see you know, some company doing that in some, some point. But um, the performance is going to be um, similar between different vendors at the moment. Um, it's, it's more, you know, like for example, um, Amazon has got some, some special features that they, they put into the JDK. 
uh, into the JVM. So, um, and the, the reason is that they actually want to get it into the main JVM stream. That's their purpose. They really want to get it in there. But it's not always easy to get it into, into the main branch. So until they do, then they'll just maintain their own thing and give it available to us for free. Any other questions about, yep, on this side? You're going to get your exercise this morning. One more question. One more question. Ah, come on, give me two I'm, more and questions. I'm being nice to you. Come on, give us two more questions. Not just Are one. you haggling with me? Yes, behind. absolutely. I'm going to ask for three just now. Be careful. We've Hello. got a coffee break anyway after this. So. Hello. Uh, you told that uh, the, the sitting format will be as fast as the plus in the future. That's a promise by Brian Goetz. Uh, yeah, but, but the thing is, uh, when you use the plus, the, the compiler knows where to put things. Yes. But on the Citring format, the first parameter is dynamic. I mean, which, which can be fetched ah. from database for the locales. Ah. So isn't, isn't it going to be an issue? No. Um, you see, what they can do is they can do code generation. So they can actually do all the parsing of, this, of, the, of the format up front of the string that you're going to generate, and then generate code that does the same as plus. So, um, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it'll be for every type of combination of, like, because with, with format you can do quite a lot, but for the, for the simple, uh, like, you know, putting placeholders in there, um, I, I believe it, it, is, it is technically possible to do that, to actually have code that, that, that does the same as just normal plus. I mean, most of the time, the format is just syntactic sugar for, for, for the normal plus. Easier to read. And it's, it's often like this with performance. You know, you, you, you do something because it's faster. You use plus because it's faster. You use string builder because it's faster. But then, over time, these rules change. And what was faster then is no longer faster now. You said one more question, right? <laughs> right, okay. This, this is the home of democracy, so put your hand in the air if you think we should give Heinz one more question. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right, guys. okay, thank you. okay. The autocrat dies. You get one more question. Yeah, yeah, I'm go. Give it to Yorgo in front here. And this is the last one. I'm going to be outside anyway after this. More questions. So, thank you, Heinz. Thanks, and, uh, so you said that uh, the field is changing all the time, the rules. Yep. So... Uh, what should we take away if we want to write uh, performant code? What should be one of the things that we should uh, do in That's our daily, daily work so that our code will be performant in general? Write code which is as simple as possible to read and understand. Write code that's compact and that's simple. The less lines of code, the better. The more compact, the better. The easier to understand, the better. Stuff which is very widely, you know, many, many lines, many byte codes, is more difficult for the hotspot profiler to optimize. So, you know, follow established patterns. The moment that you use special tricks to make things faster, and you sort of prove with a very bad JMH a test that it's faster, but not necessarily faster. So keep things simple and easy to understand, easy to read, and then the, let the hotspot profiler make it fast for you. Thank you very much.